Our first lesson today is from the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 65, verses 1 through 9. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walked in a way that is not good, following their own devices. A people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and offering incense on bricks, who sit inside tombs, who spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh with broth of abominable things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day long. See, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their laps their iniquities and their ancestors' iniquities together, says the Lord. Because they offer incense on the mountains and reviled me on the hills, I will measure into their laps full payment for their actions. Thus says the Lord, as the wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. So I will do for my servants' sake and not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, inheritors of my mountains. My chosen shall inherit it, and my servants shall settle there. The word of the Lord, holy wisdom. Thanks be to God. That was lovely. Thank you. Um, let's attend to our second reading for this morning, which is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, he being Jesus, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time, he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now, there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. Holy wisdom, holy word. I want to assume I'm the only 
a kind of visitor in a sense. Uh, I hope there are others here today. Uh, whenever a preacher is asked to come and, and be with a congregation, uh, we try to imagine what's going on in the congregation. And so I, I know you've been through a period of looking for an interim minister and that that person starts next week. Uh, so I, I'm picking up on some excitement about that. I also know that um, interim times can be a, a journey for a congregation. <clears throat> and um, so I held that uh, one bit of knowledge in mind as I read our gospel reading for today and imagined a sermon that might be a word from the Lord for you all today. Let's pray that it would be so. Would you join me? Uh, gracious God, we, we come here today to hear a word from you. Uh, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I have a colleague that I admire very much, and we were at a group retreat for church leaders a couple of years ago. And she, during our time of sharing, she told us, uh, all of us who were there at the retreat, about a recent visit that she'd had with her doctor. Brenda has a chronic condition that has caused her to have numerous surgeries and endless visits to doctors in uh, a constant but so far fruitless search. At the retreat, she told us that she and her primary care doc had gone over her medical history once again. Then at the end of the appointment, without recommending any new treatments for the time being, the doctor offered to walk her out to the elevator. As the elevator was approaching their floor, he turned to my friend, looked her in the eyes, and said quite emphatically, I want you to know that you have done nothing wrong. You have done nothing wrong he said. When one has a condition, one wonders about that. Everyone you know wonders about it too. Maybe it makes us feel like we have some bit of control over suffering if we believe that the problem could have been prevented or could still be fixed. It may in fact be easier to believe that something was done wrong than it is to simply acknowledge that the suffering has a life of its own. To hear such a statement from a medical professional, well, to us preachers who were gathered and heard that story, it sounded a lot like what the church calls absolution, a kind of total exoneration, a powerful spiritual statement of release. So we were thunderstruck by this story and for the rest of our retreat together, at appropriate moments, we would turn to each other and say, you have done nothing wrong. Well, Beulah Presbyterian Church has a chronic condition. And here on the eve of your new interim pastor coming, I want to look you in the eyes and declare in no uncertain terms, you have done nothing wrong. Your chronic condition is simply called change. Change comes when one's pastor's life changes and that pastor leaves. Change comes when the congregation members come and go. Change comes when the church's neighborhood or its denomination are in flux. Change is a chronic condition, and we all have it. You have done nothing wrong. You simply have a condition. In contrast, today's story in Luke details another sort of community, and it's a kind of cautionary tale for us to consider it. Let's take a look at the story in which Jesus scares the bejeebers out of a community by casting the bejeebers out of one of its members. What in the world is going on here? The setting is a town we can call Jerasa, on the eastern side of the Galilee Lake. To a Jewish audience hearing this story, they would be concerned with holiness. Everything about this 
uh, suffering man screams unclean. Uh, living in and out of tombs, naked, pigs nearby, these are all signals that this story is partly about Gentiles, about nations that are not in line with the holiness code given by God to the Jews. So a first century Jewish audience for this story might not even want Jesus to go there and help, much less expect the people there to be helped. So to these early Jewish Christians, what Jesus accomplished in Gerasa sends a clear message about his divinity and the vast reach of God beyond their own place and their own culture. It's about the expansion of their sense of mission to include the Gentiles. To bring that point home, the story makes it clear that there had been attempts to at least restrain this man in the past, but he's even broken his chains and his shackles. So his condition is chronic and severe, but the problem's not too large for Jesus. The suffering man is restored to his right mind, puts on clothes, interesting detail, and is able to talk about what happened to him. So how do the onlookers respond? Well, they're afraid, of course. Fear is a natural response to a sudden change and an encounter with power, even if it's good power. And that's why in the Bible, God's messengers always start with, be not afraid. Still, I want to think, to think about this, because after some initial shock, why didn't they ask Jesus to stay? This wasn't the only sick person in Gerasa. Why didn't they go and, form, and bring their suffering relatives and form a line? That's what happened in other healing stories with Jesus. But here in Gerasa, to quote a Bible commentary I read, quote, they recognize the mystery and the power of what has taken place, but they cannot make a place for it or accommodate their lives to it. They cannot make a place for it or accommodate their lives to it. Their response, therefore, is to ask Jesus to leave. No wonder the man who's been healed asked Jesus if he can get in the boat with him and leave and become one of his disciples. Who would want to stay in a community that is so reluctant to make a place in its life for God's mystery and power, even after seeing it at work? When Jesus tells the man, no, stay here and tell people how much God has done for you, He's sending him into a pretty tough audience. I don't want to be unfair to the people of Gerasa, but it's almost like they preferred the old days when they could feel good about themselves because they could always say, at least I'm not like that naked howling man down in the tombs. Suddenly, it makes some sense that they had tried to shackle him, but maybe not to cure him. Maybe keeping his condition chronic kept them from facing their own much more deadly condition, a chronic condition, apparently. Their condition was that they could recognize the mystery and power of what God has done, but at the same time refuse to make a place for it or accommodate their lives to it. In contrast, one can see that merely suffering from the chronic condition called change is no big deal compared to the Jurassa condition. When we're only going through change, at least we can still say to each other, you have done nothing wrong. Not only that, we can keep recounting the mystery and the power of what God has done and is still doing in our lives we can celebrate that mystery and power and make a place for it in our lives and in our life together. If the road seems rocky during a time of transition, like you all are going through, if tensions increase, as may very well happen, we can still give each other 
a powerful spiritual release and exoneration because we trust in what God can do with our condition. Well, we can only hope that in Jirasa as well, the persistent efforts of that healed man to tell his story fell on some receptive ears. And indeed, scripture does say that many people in the area were amazed. I only wish he could have had the kind of reception Beulah Presbyterian Church would have given him. A warm reception, judging from my own experience here and what I hear about you. May God bless you on your journey with the chronic condition of change. May God bless all the people who come to you during this time for mutual sharing about God's mystery and power. May you make room for them and for God's action in this place and time. Would you join me for a word of prayer? God, we're grateful to know that you are always with us, that our chronic condition of change is one that you even give to us as a gift so that we learn to depend on you. We thank you for the interim pastor who starts next week and for the next stages in this journey with you. May we always find a way to make that place for you in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.